that Claire Swift is a specialist in uh, what we could traditionally call data loss prevention. Some people call it information security. Some people call it data security. Um, but we've been working in that space for over 20 years. Clear Swift have a number of products, but today we're just going to focus on how we integrate with file transfer. Uh, there are risks with file transfer, and it, in a lot of organizations, and I will say um, hand on heart, this was a risk in our organization, which we did not address for a long time when I was a customer, is we put controls in around what people can send us or that we would be prepared to receive as emails. Um, it seemed sensible. There were solutions out there for doing that. Um, we put controls in about what people could upload and download to the web and what websites they could connect to. And then we needed to transfer files with partners. And so we built a file transfer server, eventually migrated into an MFT. But basically, if someone had access to that server, um, whether they were uh, the legitimate partner or whether it was someone who had stolen their credentials, then they could upload or download whatever they liked onto that platform and we could send any files we liked. There was no content control applied to that. If you had access to it, you could put a file on it. Now, in a lot of cases, those are automated uh, transfers that happen and quite tightly controlled. Um, but as the uh, National Cyber Security Center will advise, supply chain risk is now um, a top attack vector where if someone wants to compromise your organization, uh, the easiest way to start is quite often to take control of uh, something in the supply chain. So one of your suppliers or uh, uh, someone that you sell to uh, is compromised and then that is used to leverage an attack on you. So having security around what your supply chain can and cannot send you is important. If you are expecting someone in your supply chain to send you an XML file, or an EDI file, why would you allow them to send you a binary executable? So we have controls that you can uh, operate around this and they work in two modes. So ClearSwift have uh, a feature that we call adaptive DLP. Now adaptive DLP is full Monty, the real deal. Um, and that lets you take alternative remediation strategies. So in a traditional DLP system, you scan your content you work out whether it conforms with your policy, and then you either allow it or you block it, or sometimes you just log it. But those are your only real outcomes in a traditional DLP system. ClearSwift extends that. We can modify the data in real time as it's being transferred. So perhaps we could redact out parts of the message that uh, don't conform with your policy. Um, and there are several ways that could be, um, which I'll demonstrate. Um, and this can be integrated into your MFT workflows. And that means that you can have data control policies that don't necessarily interrupt your business process or workflow. Uh, and it can bring your file transfers in line with your security policies. And this is really important because now this file transfer platform has the opportunity to offer you extended value because you can control what is and is not transferred through it you can extend the use beyond automated flows, possibly use it as a file sharing and collaboration platform um, where you can uh, jointly work on documents with your supply chain or other partners. Uh, and that can massively extend the value that you get from your MFT investment. Okay, so we're onto the demo screen. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. I've got just loads of uh, file windows open on it. I'm just going to go to my FileZilla and I am going to connect it to my uh, Go Anywhere MFT by SFTP. So now I can drop files in there. So I've got some demo files at the bottom here. And when they're processed, they'll end up in this folder that's at the top of the screen that's currently empty. So let's start with this one. This is the ICAR test virus. So it's not really a virus, but all AV engines will detect it as if it was a virus. Now, this is the number one thing that people want to do when they check data that's uploaded. Does it have an infection in it? Um, and we can offer you a choice of three different AV engines built into the platform uh, that you can use to scan. And you can use all three together if you want to, if you uh, have that level of risk, um, we can meet that for you. And what our engine will do is actually take it all apart. So it will find that ICAR test virus, even though it's inside a zip, 
inside another zip file and it could actually go down 50 layers of recursion into the document so i'm going to take this file drag it into my mft the mft will process it and then it will turn up in this folder at the top now you can see what's happened here is actually it's been renamed error i can't com 2zipham so the original file name was just icar 2zip uh, and it's been renamed here if i open it it'll show you yes this has indeed triggered the virus detection so i'm able to have a meaningful error message here that says what happened to the file now someone at this point normally asks but what if i really did need that original file um, i have got a copy of it so the original files i've stored here um, and in this blocked folder you can see i've actually moved a copy of the original but it's somewhere out of the way that the is not normally accessed so uh, you can make that a restricted area that only an administrator can get to okay so that's the simple one find a virus detect it job done now what about file types i said you might want to control data by file type so that would be uh, perhaps you don't allow binaries you're expecting to get an xml or a text file or a csv or something like that why would you allow people to upload binaries so what i've got here is the windows calculator just to prove it is i'll double click it there's the windows calculator and if i take that binary executable and i drop that one in that should also trigger the error message in the received file but now you can see it's been blocked for a different reason it's been detected as an executable file and therefore blocked because my upload folder has a policy in not to allow executable files to be received now it doesn't matter if you rename the file it's not scanning the file name it's actually looking at the file content so if i go in here and i rename this file txt yes i do want to rename it and i upload it it will still trigger the um, executable detection it can tell that's a binary executable even though i've named the file calc.txt so that means you can't evade it by simply renaming the file okay then the other way that you can get code into your organization is actually when it's attached bundled up inside a pdf or an office document so this is the threat from macros and again the national cyber security center had quite a lot of information on the risk of macros there are lots of ways you can mitigate that risk but our approach is actually we can modify the document to remove the active code during the upload process so i will open this document here it's a pdf document it's got a javascript in it and that javascript executes as soon as you open the document so if i could tr trick someone into opening this document thinking it was safe i could put malicious code in here that could possibly install malware or ransomware or something else that you don't want in your organization so i don't want to allow that document to be uploaded with the code in it now i could block it outright when i detect that code in but if you have our adaptive dlp then you can do this i'll drop it in the folder it'll turn up here it looks the same it hasn't been renamed because it's not a, it's not a blocked file when i open it the text is still in the pdf document if there were images the images would still be in it but that pop-up didn't happen and the pop-up didn't happen because we have removed the code from within the document and made the document safe for you to receive again the copy of that original document if you needed the code for some reason you can keep a copy of the original if you want to um, in a separate part of your workflow where it can't be accessed by your normal users okay so that's your um, use case one your security risk just making sure that what you're receiving is what you're expecting to receive it doesn't have a virus it doesn't have executables it doesn't have active code in now let's look at the other side maybe you want to make sure that you protect data that um, matches your uh, data set so i've got here a set of mock data so this is just um, purely fictional data a, a customer database lots and lots of data in there now the trouble is detecting an email address doesn't necessarily mean that you're detecting something that you want to block email addresses occur all the time the same for ip addresses but under GDPR and other uh, privacy rules, if that IP address or email address could be related to a user that you're responsible for their data, 
then that might be something that you need to control. So we have a mechanism that lets you load this in and uh, apply your rules just to the data in your data set. So this could come from an employee database, a customer database, um, a loyalty card database, anywhere that you might be storing data about people. So what I've got here is I've created a sample file that has, this has uh, a surname and an IP address. This is a real record. In the data table, this IP address belongs to this person. I've also then put in my own name and IP address. I'm not in the customer table, so this should not be redacted. This one is in the data table, but that's just an IP address. I haven't included the person's name. And then this is just a first name and an IP address, and this one's just a surname and an IP address. So what would happen if we put that through? I'm gonna drop that into here. And then the one that comes out, this is interesting. The one that was a real record, it's detected that record and I've actually redacted it. Now, I use redaction because it's a really visual way to show what I've done. I could block it, I could redirect it, I could notify someone. Once I've detected that text, I can take action. Okay, but my record with my name and IP address has not been redacted because my name and IP address is not in the customer table. So this means you're not getting false positives. It's only triggering for real records that really exist in your database. Then this one here that's just an IP address but didn't have any corroborating information about the customer in it, that hasn't been redacted. But then the following two where there was just the first name or just the surname, those have been redacted. So you can see here I'm able to be really specific about multi-field matches in my data set to uh, get the effect that I want. This is a really powerful tool that helps you protect your most sensitive data. Okay, now I also have here uh, uh, some files that have classification marks in. So I said we work with Titus and Bolton James. There's lots of ways people put classification marks into documents. It might go into the document header or the footer where the page numbers go, it might go into the watermark, um, and it might also go into the document properties. So if I show you this one, this document contains a classification mark. If I look in the document properties on the custom tab, there is one here called, scroll down, Titus classification. So this here is a classification mark that's been added by Titus and it's marked as secret. So the one that is mark one is um, a public document, mark two is secret and mark three is top secret. I can pick those up and drop those into the folder. That is the only difference between these uh, files. The rest of the file is the same, it's just the classification mark has changed. And you can see the one that was public has come through. So if I enable editing and show you the document properties, this still has the public classification mark in, but this document was uploaded fine. The one that had the top secret mark in, that's been detected as classification mark uploaded. So that's a restricted classification. It can't be uploaded into this folder and therefore it's been rejected. So if you're using classification marking or you're thinking about using classification marking, we can use that to enforce rules about file transfers. Okay, those were my three use cases. 